you. Welcome back. Uh, this is our next fireside chat here on stage two. I'm delighted to welcome uh, Walter Van Toll, Head of Sustainability and Community Affairs at DS Smith. And we are talking circularity and carbon. So a warm welcome for Walter, please. Thank you. OK, well, I guess we'll start at the obvious place. Uh, DS Smith working, obviously, in, in the packaging space. Huge name, huge player in that area. A huge challenges involved in the packaging world when it comes to making sure there's a circular approach, recycling, so many things at play there. It must be a huge challenge. Yes, it is, and uh, it's, it's probably good to just quickly uh, introduce DS Smith. So it's a FTSE 100 company, uh, paper packaging. So we don't do plastic, just, just paper packaging. Uh, and we have three parts to the company, and this is where circularity comes in. So we have a recycling business that picks up recycled paper and cardboard. Then we have a paper division who get that paper and they make new paper out of it, and then a packaging division. And you can see once they once we sell the boxes to our customers, we receive them back again, and so the loop continues. And that's a 14-day cycle. Is 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 the is how we how quickly we can do that. So that's where the circularity comes in. But at the moment, there's so many challenges in packaging, and uh, it's it's wide-ranging. One is, of course, we all know about the plastic challenges, uh, lots of problem plastics around. You will remember the Blue Planet uh, uh, TV uh, program, and that's where it all started. So then came a lot of regulation. There's even more regulation. I don't know if anybody here has heard about the packaging and packaging waste regulation. Crikey, that is quite a lot to, to cope with. Um, and I'm sure it's core bedtime reading for everyone in the room. Uh, <laughs> well, it's quite a challenge to summarize, but if anybody <laughs> wants to know, I'll try. Um, and um, uh, of course, there's just um, uh, customers. Our customers are the big fa fast moving consumer goods companies and the big e commerce players. And they really want to reduce their carbon and they want to become more circular. And they're coming to us because, of course, it is a heck of a challenge to do that. And by using circular economy principles, we try to help them to reduce carbon, reduce water use, reduce uh, uh, impacts all along the supply chain. I'll just stick with customers there because you, you've mentioned mm. that. I was going to come to that, that later. But do you feel over time that pressure, that demand for circular solutions, sustainable solutions, is it, is it increasing? Is, it, is the pressure rapidly increasing? Oh, sure. The interest in circular solutions is there. Uh, but sometimes it comes in different shapes. Sometimes it's a question about uh, carbon, and that is super relevant. A lot of you will know that scope three emissions are a big topic right now. So our customers come to us, say, how can you reduce your emissions because you are our scope three emissions? Uh, or they might ask about waste, or they might ask about cost reduction. But by using this circular economy principles, you can deliver on all those at the same time sometimes if you're clever and that's where the the sort of the uh, the art and the science comes in i know valter is, is very keen to take uh, questions throughout uh, uh, this fireside chat so i'm going to do uh, one more in just a second um about redefining packaging and then i'm going to come to the audience slightly earlier than normal uh, and then we'll come back at the end so if you've got any particular questions have them uh, have them ready um but the the expression you use uh, on online as a business is redefine packaging in a changing world Again, that's a challenge. What sort of examples have you got of how you go about redefining something like that? Well, uh, some of these things are really clear to see. So one of them was COVID, and everybody started using e-commerce a lot more. There was a huge boom in e-commerce, and therefore of packaging. Um, and, and that had a huge impact on us, not just uh, the things that you see at home, but also behind the scenes. So we wanted to say, how can we help our e-commerce partners and, and consumers to, to do the right thing. Everybody's probably frustrated by buying a toothbrush online and getting it in a huge big box. Nobody wants the empty space, right? So that's where our designers come in. So what we did is we trained, we have 600 designers, product designers, and we trained them all in circular economy principles. And they now apply that. And uh, by doing that, we have managed to reduce that, that void space. We reduce. Um, uh, you know, miles essentially, you know, uh, truck miles because we just use less space, etc. So that is uh, e-commerce is a, is a great example of uh, the changing world. 
Okay, well, let's go, to, let's go to the room early on this one. Has anyone got any particular questions? We have one here, if we can just... Uh, and then we'll go there, and we... Oh, well, I'm not going to have to do any work today. This is fantastic. So just there, please, Charlie. Hi. Uh, my name's Ivor Tucker. I run a company called Generation C, which aims to connect the decarbonisation activities of companies like yours with schools and school kids, so kids get to understand that there are solutions being applied and it's not all doom and gloom. Um, be interested to know what a company like yours, obviously clearly you've got massive innovations and there are lots of things, that, the stuff that, that kids would be um, aware of all the time, but they don't know what goes on behind the scenes. So how do you have any programs to integrate your activities with schools in terms of school outreach, or um, how, how do you help to, to educate the general public about yes. what you're doing? That's a great question, thank you. So um, we're trying to reach five million people uh, through uh, about circular economy, to educate them on circular economy. And we do that partly th through online means, but partly through lesson plans. So we created a, a lesson plan, actually, a circular economy lesson plan, which is available uh, online for free. And, and that's, what we, uh, th that's what we've promoted, and that's been used quite well. So um, from experience, I would say it's sometimes hard to engage as a company with education systems and governments because they might not trust it. So we just said, here's the lesson plan, and if you think it's a useful tool, please use it for free. Yeah. Okay, next question, I believe, uh, just stay in the pink, and then we'll come down to the front. And I believe there's another one on the front. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Um, my name is David Lowesby. I'm a professor of research impact at Leeds University Business School. Um, one of the things that often people talk about is actually we want change, and we need lots and lots of change in different ways. To what extent is that being enabled through behavioral science being one of the prime enablers of um, change and transformation in many organizations? In fact, has been around for quite a number of years, but I wondered to what extent you were using that in, in your area. Um, gosh, that's a, that's, a, that's a big question. I What I can say from my perspective, I'm the head of sustainability for DS Smith, so for me, uh, I look less at how consumers change, because that's more our marketing and R&D uh, colleagues. I look more at how can I change the 30,000 people who, uh, uh, who work for DS Smith, and how can I work with customers and suppliers to help them change as well. And all the usual things uh, in behavioral science uh, apply, I would say. And the, uh, the bell curve of change, you know, the uh, adoption of innovations, all those sorts of things uh, apply. And um, what has helped me most, and if I give one tip, it would be this one, is uh, to essentially people are talking about integrating sustainability into the organization so that you don't just have a central function doing it, but it's integrated in the whole organization. And I found it particularly helpful to have implants, as I call them. Um, basically, people who've been in my team, and I farm them out to other departments, they are trusted because they're part of that tribe, and then it, so it continues. So one person in my team now works in group finance, and group finance was not the biggest supporter previously of sustainability, but they are now. And so it's a lot about that feeling of, those departments and functions getting the advice from inside rather than from outside. So that, that's one thing. Okay, thank you. I think our next question was just at the front here in the seat. Thank you. Hello, uh, Andrew Whitehorn. I've worked with a number of resource management re recycling companies. Um, whilst we wait for government policy to become consistent around packaging, waste, etc., how do you feel industry is responding, uh, or rather leading clients in terms of sustainable packaging solutions? Um, one, one challenge that I've seen consistently over the years is the, the, the variety of different polymer types yeah. that they're using, and particularly lamination, combining different, uh, you know, you've got a cart and it's got metal, it's got a bit of paper, it's got pulp, etc., and it creates huge challenges in that, in that recycling system. Is that momentum really building now in the packaging industry to educate clients and uh, you know the, the, the product can, uh, manufacturers to to move ahead far faster than perhaps regulation is, is driving us? Yes. Yeah, so the history there is, of course, that packaging weight was always the thing that we tried to work on, and uh, I'm saying we as the industry of packaging industry, not DS Smith, because we only do paper. But if I briefly talk about polymers. 
the quest for lower weight led to multi-material, multi-layer solutions, flexible packaging in particular. Now you find out that you have different polymer types and that becomes unrecyclable and so it basically has to go to landfill or, or incineration. So what a lot of those manufacturers are doing are going is to keep multi-layers but make it single polymer family solutions. And that's kind of, that makes it more recyclable but then you look at how much plastic is recycled in practice and gosh, that's, it's a step towards that. But for us, um, one of the things we do which customers are really interested in is to replace problem plastics. Look, sometimes plastic is really important as a barrier for medical, uh, for, for med uh, medication, for example, or for certain food technologies, uh, food applications. But very often plastic is there just because it's convenient or because somebody internally knows a lot about it or something like that. So what we do is we find uh, paper uh, solutions for that. So we replace plastics. We've replaced hundreds of millions of pieces of problem plastics over the past few years. And um, by, by doing that, you basically have more products that are widely recycled because 86% of paper is recycled in the EU, for example. So by, by doing that, we are doing our bit to create more mono materials. Yeah. Okay, I think the next question was just here at the front. Hi, I'm uh, Paul Mampili from Springboard Futures. Uh, we're a consultancy company. Um, I picked up, if I'm not mistaken, when you were talking about clients coming to you and asking you how you can reduce their carbon footprint, you said if we are lucky, we're able to do that. Um, in, in certain cases. So I'd just like to understand what exactly did you mean by that, if you could elaborate, and also what are your biggest challenges you face uh, when clients come to you for such solutions? Is it because they don't follow up in, in terms of your advice, or is it that you do find it difficult to give them solutions to uh, whatever they may be seeking? Uh, the, the difficulty is not so much that we can't design solutions that are lower carbon. The difficulty is more in the data, uh, because Okay, I'm going to become really nerdy now, but scope three emissions data uh, is typically not available exactly in the form that customers want. It is almost like we're at the iPhone 2 stage and customers want us to be at the iPhone 14 stage. And we have to go through the motions of improving the data and improving the systems so that we can answer their questions exactly. And so it is that I'm trying to work with my organization to get them to the iPhone 14, but you can't go there in one go, right? So that is, that's the difficulty. Okay, any other, qu oh, we have a, another question just over to the side, please, Charlie. Hi, uh, my name is Raj Aryan. I'm representing Eurasia Carbon. Uh, just a small question for you and the industry in general because you're there. Do you think the idea of offsetting using potentially you know, voluntary carbon markets or even compliance markets in a way in the carbon industry would be a way to move towards funding um, you know, reforestation projects, Red Plus projects? Do you think that's a good idea? Do you think it would be worth it for your industry? I cannot speak for the industry. I can only speak for Dear Smith. And for us, offsetting is a last resort. Uh, and we're really trying to reduce our emissions in other ways, uh, more, di more directly. Um, we are involved in, we, we have our own forest. It's not, not a huge amount, but we have some of our own forest. Of course, our suppliers have forests, so we are working on regenerative ideas of uh, regenerative forestry. That is still early stage, but that is, that's the kind of thing we do. Uh, for our uh, science-based target, one and a half degree science-based target by 2030, offsetting doesn't count anyway. So for us, it comes more in the sort of maybe for the emissions that we can't otherwise reduce in the sort of 20, late 2040s. For us, that's when it comes in. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions before? Oh, we've still got hands going up. Charlie, keeping you busy. Uh, if you want to just take the one closest to you on your right there, and then we'll, we'll move forward there. Hello. Oh, yeah, that's on. Uh, hi, my name's Olivia. I'm with Client Earth. We're an environmental law NGO. Um, we do lots of work on policy and regulation. And 
It's intriguing to hear. Obviously, it's great to hear that 86 percent of paper in the EU is being recycled. Um, but I'd be intrigued to hear about if that's happening in other area, areas of the world, especially in the knowledge that, you know, even when we recycle plastic, only 9% of that plastic actually gets recycled. So yeah, just intrigued to hear what the paper recycling infrastructure looks like around the world. Um, Cause obviously there's billions and billions of people living in the global South. So it'd be great to hear about if it's expanded in there. Yeah, and uh, great work that Client Earth does, by the way. Um, so, um, I, again, I can't speak for areas where we don't operate because I don't know enough about the recycling there. I can only speak on UK, EU and North America. And what I would say is um, the biggest challenge in those, uh, and I appreciate that's not the global south, sorry. <laughs> what I would say is that consistency of collections is generally the issue. And uh, there's no, not much consistency across the EU. And in the UK, I mean, I don't know how many of you live in the UK and, and, and how your recycling works, but you can live, lit, it's a postcode lottery, what kind of recycling you get, which is a, a, a real shame because from a circular economy point of view, all that waste is a resource and you want it to be collected, segregated, particularly paper because it's so easily recycled. Any paper can make any paper and that's not the case for, for plastics. So for me, the, the key is consistency of collections and segregation of the, of the materials that are easiest recycled or easiest reused. Okay, uh, well, we'll go just to uh, Charlie, just uh, there in the middle, and then we'll come close to the front and then I will wrap up with a couple of my own questions okay. because All the right. audience has rather taken over today. All right. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Harriman, nice to meet you. Thank you very much for your um, talk so far. Um, I'm interested in reuse, because you've talked a lot about recycling, but is yeah. there anything we can do without resorting to the high energy required by uh, recycling with all these paper products that are being produced at a very high volume? Thank you. Yeah, great question. So um, if you look at some of the regulation that is coming from the EU, it seems that the point of view that's been taken is that reuse is always better than recycling because you look at the waste hierarchy you know re reduce reuse recycle etc and you say well re reuse is higher in the in the in that hierarchy than recycling so it must be better unfortunately that's not always the case because in some use cases in some supply chains recycling is more efficient is the best outcome for the environment overall across a uh, number of metrics and some, sometimes it's reuse. So the number one problem already is that there's a, quite a dogmatic approach that doesn't take into account what's actually best for the environment. Um, then the second thing is um, uh, reuse would, in the case of, for example, you can replace all the cardboard transport boxes that are being used, that are manufactured, for example, by D.S. Smith, you could replace that with plastic crates. Now, the logistics that you would require are enormous. The amount of plastic, the millions tons of plastics that that would require, you'd go straight back into a plastic economy. So, um, and then if you look at how many times you would have to reuse that plastic crate and how it would have to be cleaned, yeah, all those sorts of things, in many cases, that would be a worse outcome for the environment. So I guess what I'm calling for is, uh, because we are looking into reuse ourselves as well, even though paper is not the most reuse friendly product because it doesn't like water, um, is uh, we need, to, it's, it's sort of horses for courses. We need to be more evidence-based in which use cases, in which supply chain is reuse best, and in which cases is recycling best, and then commit to that. Okay, thank you very much. And I think we just had one further question at the front, and then I will uh, wrap up with a couple of my own. Thank you. Hello, Soren here from Water150. Um, I would love to hear your experience on cost or complexity in terms of sustainable packaging. Does sustainable packaging come at a, at a cost in, in those terms, or uh, it, yeah, in comparison yeah. to regular? Um, not always. Obviously, the first thing to look at is waste. And ideally, if you take the lens of waste, quite often you find that you can 
have a more sustainable solution at a lower cost, at a higher profit. Uh, and that's obviously the best case, but that's sort of the, the easy pickings, right? That's the low hanging fruit. Then you get to the more difficult things, like how do you decarbonize products that require heat and uh, industrial heat? That could be paper, it could be cement, it could be steel or whatever else. And then for that decarbonization process, there will be extra costs. And as a society, I think you know, it's not just our customers because ultimately they look at, they listen to their consumers. You know, are we prepared to pay that on cost? That is that is part of the part of the issue. And of course, these technologies will become cheaper over time. But at the moment, quite often there's an on cost. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and Voucher, if I if I could just finish up with a couple of questions because yeah. we've uh, we've been uh, blessed with so they've many questions. They've been doing a job for you. I know. I know. Yeah. I could have yeah. brought a drink through with me. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't do that, that'd be deeply unprofessional. Um, the question I wanted to go to last is about any uh, myths or common misconceptions you see, particularly between the link between circularity and, and carbon. Are there any that spring to mind? Uh, the, the biggest one that, that springs to mind is that people think that circular solutions are always lower carbon as well, and that's simply not the case. It is entirely possible to design a highly circular solution which is actually worse in terms of carbon. So. Uh, one of the things that we've done is to, when we design, when our designers help our customers to design packaging, we have a tool called the Circular Design Metrics, and they look at six different metrics of what the impact is of the design solution that we've come up with. And that means you can see the trade-off, for example, between carbon and circularity. And so the customer can make the decision which metrics are the most important for our sustainability goals and then choose that design. But you need to be aware of the trade-offs at all times because you know uh, you don't want to get that bit wrong. Okay, well, so that's a, a great place for us to, to leave things, I think. Uh, you've been incredibly generous with your time when it comes to questions and things. So everyone, a round of applause for Valter, please. Yeah. Thank you.